something in your way when we are ready to praise him. So we're glad that things seem to be working now and we're going to start our praise. And I would ask if you all can please stand with me and let's sing He is Exalted, the King is Exalted. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise his name. For he is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy day. Exalted, the king is exalted. On high. He is exalted, the king is exalted. On high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise his name. For he is the Lord. For his truth shall reign, heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. Thank you so much. You may be seated, and we're going to continue with how great is our God. The splendor of the King. Rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness starts to hide, and trembles at 
his voice and tramples at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see. come and worship before you, our Creator, our King, our Savior, and our friend. We gather in your name, and we wish to be fed from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, all of you. We're delighted you're here this morning. Welcome you. We had a kind of an interesting, exciting event there this morning. That's the second time I've climbed up that ladder to fix that. But we're good. We had quite a storm last night. Maybe you are okay. Maybe you had your... Uh, Trees, I understand Isaac had some trees fall over and had some mess, so if you need firewood, I guess, uh, give him a call. But anyway, we hope everything is well with you when we're in God's house. We praise him this morning. Time for our children's story. The children to come around. If you have dollars to give and to help with our school, they would love to get them from you as they make their way down for the children's story. Brian's going to tell the children's story, and I don't see the mic. Is there, oh, it's back there. Would you get it back there, Brian? It's back there. He has it.
teaching us what to do. Look at that. Isn't that cool? And she beamed this great big smile back at him, and it made him feel so good. We just sat there looking at each other and just kind of taking in the weather and the day, and it was so beautiful. He said, you know, that smile was so wonderful, I kind of want to see it again. So he gave her a root beer. And she took that root beer, and she gave him just the biggest smile again, and he was just so happy. And they sat there for the better part of the day, just sitting, looking at each other, and just enjoying themselves, and didn't say a word. Well, the young man got tired, and he thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go home. So he went home, and he walked in the door, and his mother said, oh, my, you look so happy. What, what did you do today? And the young man said, well, I had lunch with God. And before, she, before his mother could say anything, he said again, and she's, uh, she's got a beautiful smile. Well, meanwhile, the, the old woman went home, and she walks in, and her son looks at her, and he says, what in the world is make you so happy? She said, well, I got to sit in the park with God today. And before her son could say anything, she said, you know what? He's a little younger than I thought he'd be. <laughs> and what that kind of is is sometimes the best thing we can do is let people see God in us. Isn't that right? Okay, guys, have a happy Sabbath. Let's go back to our seats. There we go. Double duty. Um, good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. You'll notice two things about me up here. I'm sure I can see all the stairs now. One, I'm not Frank. That's right. And two, I've got a new tie. Oh. <laughs> That's what immediately stuck out, yes. Um, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, anyone visiting again, uh, thank you so much for coming. We are extremely delighted that you chose here to worship. We have a couple quick announcements and then we'll get to, uh, get to the rest of the service. Uh, first things first, I'm a big fan of potluck and just so happens we're gonna be having a fellowship dinner, uh, me, dinner in the gym right after services here. Everybody's welcome. All church potluck, everyone is welcome. If you didn't bring anything, I think uh, we said we still have enough, so please, please join us. Which kind of leads me into my next subject. We're going to be having this in the gym, and if you go in there and notice, things are just a little more pleasant while we're in there. Yes. Notice it's not as loud, the echo is not as horrendous, and it's actually almost quite pleasant to sit in there and enjoy fellowship dinner now. Amen. So that brings me to my plea, which is uh, we are so close to being done with this, guys. We're about 60 panels away, Pastor. Yep. About 60 panels away, and if you go outside the front way, you'll see the, the little stand we've got up there. And if you'd like to help us out with this, we'd really appreciate it. We're that close to the finish line. Also, if you'll see in our bulletins here, there's a couple things. One, of course, is the, uh, the sound panel project. The next one is uh, the community service center we're trying to set up over there with the old conference office. Um, if you can find some time, they would really appreciate it. This building needs to be cleaned and prepped. And I think uh, just uh, from what I understand, there's going to be some pretty wonderful things coming out of this. That's right. So if you'd like a chance to get in there and help out, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, I've said this before, uh, but I think it bears uh, repeating. Some of us are always looking for a way to minister in one way, shape, or form. And one of the ways I've found, if nothing else, is uh, the gift of giving. Now, my wife sometimes calls it a curse because it's like, well, 
Where would that go? I gave it away. But I do get so much joy, and I find that ministering and giving is one of the things that uh, really brings me a great amount of joy. And I'm hoping you guys will find the same thing, too. Uh, our offering today, if we can get the deacons to come forward, is going to be for the local church budget. Now, we all know what wonderful things are coming out of this church. And the church is doing some amazing things, and this just kind of boosts it along. So I ask it that you would uh, prayerfully consider your gift today, and I thank you in advance. Can we bow our heads? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, this is our chance to give back to you which you so abundantly give to us, Lord. We ask your blessings now, and we thank you in advance for the work that you will do with this, Lord. We ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. going to continue on with our praise and I would like to ask you one more time before you get too comfortable so you can join us please as we sing you are holy
Again, you may be seated. prepare for our prayer together and I'm going to ask our group to come down here all the way down and um, wait for you as we get ready for our prayer. Sí, no. 
Heavenly Father, surely you are in this place, Lord. For your word says where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in our midst. We come into your presence, Lord, with a boldness, Lord, a boldness not of arrogance, Lord, but of works done by your Son, Lord, and we are so thankful for that. We give you thanksgiving, Lord. We give you praise. Lord, in these latter days, our prayer lists, Lord, are growing. And that's just a testament of what, how sin has wreaked havoc on this world, Lord. We ask now, we beseech you, Father, Lord, to hear, hear our petitions. Lord, and we are so thankful that we have your Holy Spirit, Lord, to take these groanings, Lord, and bring them up to you. Lord, we ask, now expecting to receive, Lord, and thanking you in advance, Lord, for your word is true. Lord, while we suffer for a little time, we know that the end is near, Lord, and that you shall be victorious, and we just want to thank you, Lord. Please, Lord, lift these heavy hearts today, Lord. Be with them, for there are so many different requests, Lord. It's just almost impossible to try to mention all. So, Lord, I ask that you hear each every request, Lord, and that in your way, in your will, in your timing, Lord, these are all answered. We ask it now in the precious blood and the works of Christ, Lord, we do this. Amen. Welcome to Soto family today. Tough Sabbath last Sabbath. And I'm glad to see you here in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you uh, take your Bibles and open to Acts 11? Acts chapter 11. Now I'm actually skipping through a lot real quick here because we would have started and we could have gone back to Acts chapter 7, which starts a sequence of events. Chapter 7 is the stoning of Stephen. And Stephen marks the end. His stoning is deeply significant. The reason it's mentioned is because it's the end of the 70-week prophecy out of Daniel. It marks the end and a dramatic change that takes place within the church. After Stephen was stoned in that event, events moved rather quickly as they went forward. In chapter 8, we read the story of the, Philip, uh, the eunuch as he came, and Philip went and ministered to him. We also have the story of the sorcerer and the conversion and the things that took place. In chapter 9, we have where um, the... Uh, Paul was on the road to Damascus and where the light fell and where he was blinded and his began his whole change of heart. In chapter 10, in chapter 10 we have the story of Peter up on the roof in Joppa where the sheet was led down with all these animals that were in it. If you recall the story, 
We're going to look at that today. But I'm going to skip all of that and move right through to chapter 11 because in chapter 11 we find the dramatic picture that took place. So if we were to do that, why Luke included this in his book, I do not know. I do not know why Luke could and repeated this story, but I think it was of benefit for us today. So I want us to follow and pick up with that. So we've already had in chapter 10... We've had the story of the sheet coming down and going over to Cornelius' house. Cornelius was an incredible man. Even though he was a Gentile, he had been associated, he was an honest man, and he'd been associated with Jews, and he had accepted the Jewish God as his own. And he was praying to him, and he was calling upon him. And it was this event that he had not heard about the gospel. So that's why Peter, in this whole experience, well, what happened and took place? If you're with me on chapter 11, you'll pick up there. The words will be on the screen, but you can follow it in your Bible uh, together if you have that. Verse 1, and the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God, and this was a no-no. Boy, I tell you. When this news that the gospel had gone to Cornelius' house, a Gentile, this hit the fan, as they said. And the whole church was upset. Even the apostles were upset that this had taken place. And what in the world they were thinking, what in the world was Peter thinking when he had this, when he did this? Why was he doing that? What was going on in his head when he took the gospel to the Gentiles? This was not to be because the Jews were the ones to receive God's word. They were God's chosen people. They were the ones that were converted. They were the ones they understood themselves to be the church. And now Peter had stepped outside of that. Peter had stepped out and violated the common idea, the common wisdom, and he'd moved out and he'd taken the gospel to the Gentiles. And what was he doing that for? And so there would be a day of reckoning. You know what the seven last words of the church are? Seven last words of the church. They are, we've never done it that way before. We've never done it that way before. And sometimes we have that happen within the church. I remember we got into a discussion one time uh, in a church when I was first ministering about where the flowers were supposed to be placed on the pulpit area. And we were going to move them about 10 feet to one side. And that caused quite an uproar because we've never done it that way before. They were always supposed to be in the center. And we were moving to the side for for decorative reasons. Boy, you would have thought, you would have thought we had crucified one of the apostles over that event of moving the flowers because the church kind of gets stuck there. I'd like you to know the story in chapter 11 is way beyond that. This is a serious issue that the church faced. It wasn't just that we haven't done it that way before. This was a serious challenge to the thinking in the minds of the believers who were following Christ. The the new church, the new beginning, this was far different than what they had ever experienced before. They want to know, have you violated the concept of who are God's people? We understand because of birth and because Christ came to us and that Christ ministered to the Jews. He didn't go to the Gentiles because he ministered to us. Therefore, we are the ones, the Jews are the ones that are God's people and the rest are outside. Now, Jesus said, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates or the authority in Acts 1 as we could pedal back a little bit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And they could have added on there to all the other Jews, wherever they may be. But Jesus didn't say that. But it was in their mind. It was in their concept that that's where the gospel was to end. It was to only go to those that were Jews. It was assumed that the gospel was for God's chosen people, that he'd come to minister to them. All right, so let's pick this back up. In chapter 11, we're now with verse 4. I'm skipping down to verse 4. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. 
Now, you saw the story in chapter 10, which we did not look at, but now Peter repeats. He's now standing before the brethren, defending his action of what he had done. And so they're all listening. Now he's come to the day of accountability. And so now he's going to defend this, and he starts to speak with them. And so he starts from the very beginning. He said, I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance. I saw a vision. And I saw something like a large sheet being let down by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. And I looked, and there I saw the four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. And if you remember the story, he's recounting what happened in chapter 10. And then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, surely, surely not, Lord. No, 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 no. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered into my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven in a second time and said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was pulled up into heaven again and taken up there. Now, the right then, three men who had been sent from me, sent to me, from Caesarea, stopped at the house where I was staying. And the Spirit told me to go without hesitation, going down to them. These six brothers also went with me and entered the man's house. You don't do that because a Gentile was thought to be unpure, unclean. You would not go into his house. And ceremonial. Not, not that they had dust in the nail, because you could come over to my house right now and maybe be aghast. But they were going because they were ceremonial and clean. Gentiles were outside of the household of those who were clean, it was thought. And so he said, the Spirit told me to go there, to go be with them, and do not hesitate, the Spirit told him. And so he took six brothers also went with me. Now, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, if you've not, in chapter 14, it really deals with this issue really cleverly. And so she wrote, on the following morning, he set out to Caesarea, accompanied by six of his brethren. These were to be witnesses of all he should say or do while visiting the Gentiles, for Peter knew that he would be called to account for direct violation of the Jewish teachings. So he took six of the brethren with him. He knew this was going to be trouble. He knew they were not going to like it. And so he took six with him to witness this, to say, all right, come along with me. You're all going to share the guilt of this rather than by himself. Now he's telling the story to them. And so they're going, yes, 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 okay. It's going to that. The story that is about is not about clean and unclean foods. Have you caught on to that? Some people make a case of this. Well, this is God is saying this is unclean foods, and he's saying it's okay. God has made it clean. That misses the entire point of chapter 10 and 11. If you get stuck in that, you miss the great beauty of the story. And so this is not about food at all. This is about people. That's why he took with him six people to witness what was going to take place because he knew as soon as it got out he was in trouble he knew that was going to happen verse 13 he told us how he had seen an angel this is he's saying Cornelius Cornelius told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say send to Joppa for Simon who is called Peter and he said to him exactly where to go The angel told him, isn't it interesting that God would be so specific in his instructions of where he was to go? It wasn't, well, just go find somebody to talk to. He said, you need to go to Joppa. You need to go to this house of the tanner, actually. You need to find Peter, who's also called Simon. You need to find him. That's the person you need to talk to. Now, isn't it interesting that the Lord sent him to go find Peter? He wanted to find Peter was perceived to be the head, even though James was, even though Peter had denied the Lord three times. Peter still was thought to be a very prominent disciple of Christ, an apostle. So he uh, will bring you a message, the, the angel told Cornelius. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be what? You get that? 
will be saved. That's what the angel told Cornelius. Now, Cornelius had grown up in a pagan environment, but he had accepted Judaism. He, expected, he understood that God was speaking to him, and so he sent, he went and took the action. He became obedient to him and followed because he wanted his household to be saved. Whoops, back up. The gospel of Christ was to be had. He was sending him not to hear more about Judaism, but to find out what the gospel of Christ was about. And salvation in Christ alone was what was being going to be offered. So now we get the picture of him heading forward in verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit, notice this, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had upon us at the beginning. What is he referring to? What is Peter talking about as he's sharing and defending his actions? He's talking about Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon them the same way in the house of Cornelius as he did as we had that experience in the upper room when the Lord told us to wait the days after the resurrection and ascension. Those days and the tongues of fire came upon them and they spoke in tongues. That same outpouring as Peter was witnessing, as he was sharing with us, all of a sudden the Spirit of God is poured out on Cornelius and his household. He sees the tongues of fire. He sees that uh, manifestation. And then he sees the speaking in tongues Permission allowing, as Peter is standing there with his mouth, must have been hanging wide open. Why, God, the Holy Spirit, had moved on to the Gentiles and had brought the gospel to the Gentiles in the same fashion, including all of them, as he had seen in Jerusalem when they waited in the upper room. This is an important step that was taking place in the New Testament. It is an important step as we see the movement of God as he went forward. Back to our scripture, verse 16. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, if God gave them the same gift... He gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? What a profound statement Peter makes. He was sent to Cornelius' house. He had the sheet go up and down, and immediately the men were at the door. He went with them. The Spirit said, go with them. He went to the house. He started to share with them. He went into the house because the Spirit of God had told him. And while he was there, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in tongues. They had the tongues of fire just as they'd had at Pentecost. And this experience showing that the gospel now, that the Spirit had moved and was now anointing and alighting and filling Gentiles. And Peter now defending himself to the apostles and the other believers, the other church family, the other Jews who had become believers in Christ. He's now defending his actions, and he turns to them and said, now, now what was I to do? How could I not understand God's way? Peter had witnessed the work of the Holy Spirit. He had seen that. He had not only seen it at Pentecost, but now he sees it in Cornelius' home. He wasn't expecting it, as they weren't expecting it at Pentecost. But he witnessed and he saw that take place. And so did the other six witnesses that were with him. They all went with him. Can you imagine if he had done this on his own? He was smart to take the others with him. The Spirit was working outside of Peter's belief system. Now, here's the point of the story I want you to grasp. You see, 
they already had in their mind exactly how God was going to operate in his salvation offer. They already had come to an understanding. The believers in Christ had already understood the parameters under which it would happen. They understood that it was going to be to God's people. They had understood they had what we would call conventional wisdom. If you would ask them, yes, it's to be shared. Yes, we're going to go to Samaria. Yes, we're to go to these other parts of the earth, looking for God's people, the Jews who were God's people. And they are the ones, they are the ones who will receive the gospel. That's where we are to take our message. That was the concept of the idea. And now the Spirit of God was moving outside of their parameters. And when they heard this, and when they heard this, I'm pausing there because this is what we need to get. When they heard this, they heard the testimony and what had taken place, not just from Peter, but from the others, that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had happened, that they had spoken tongues, that they could see the tongues of fire, that they could see this event taking place in Cornelius' home, that of a Gentile. When they heard this, notice their response. And when they heard this, they had no further objections. And praise God, saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. We find this story at the conclusion of the sacrifice, the martyrdom, of Stephen. When the 70 weeks prophecy had come to an end, the 70 weeks of 490 years to determine upon your people, it had come to an end. And immediately the gospel, according to the Acts, immediately the gospel then goes to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. Now I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. But the gospel of salvation is offered to me. What changed their thinking? What was it that happened that changed their thinking? How could they now be completely, totally turned around on their view that they had all held they all held that that was, even Peter was hesitant. You see, Peter was hesitant. And the Spirit had to tell him to go, or he wouldn't have gone. He became obedient. He felt he couldn't stop the Spirit of God. He felt compelled because God had given him this vision that he had to go, or he would not have gone because it was outside of what he thought. When they saw the moving of the Holy Spirit outside of their belief system, they had to change their thinking when they saw that, that's what happened. Book Acts of the Apostles again. On hearing this account, the brethren were silenced, she says, convinced that Peter's course was in direct fulfillment of the plan of God and that their prejudice and exclusiveness were utterly contrary to the spirit of the gospel. They glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. She goes on, this without controversy. Prejudice was broken down. The exclusiveness established by the custom of the ages was abandoned. And the way was opened for the gospel to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. And from then, Paul was pulled into the picture and Paul took the gospel to the Gentile world. And if you are a Gentile, you can thank Paul someday. When you get there, say, ah, oh, thank you very much for taking the gospel, including me. I am delighted to have that truth. All right, this gives us pause then. What are we to gather today? What are we to grasp today? I would like to share some examples with you. The first one has to deal with the um, Millerite movement. Whoops, sorry. Something got stuck. The Willamite movement. And that the great prophecy of the 2300 days was coming to an end on October 22, 1844. And if you know the story of William Miller, he got up, he proclaimed that the Lord was returning, that he would appear 
sometime in 1843, 1844. S.S. Snow, another young man, studied the scriptures, and he came and said, it's going to happen on October 22, 1844. The Lord will return, we'll be glorious. They had these great, wonderful camp meetings that they had in which they would get together, the believers, and thousands of people would show up. Thousands of people preparing for the Lord to return and that he would be there at these camp meetings. But if you've been paying attention, the Lord did not return on October 22, 1844. He did not come. This is a picture of Ascension Rock where many in New England gathered expecting they were all in their Sunday best, all ready to go to heaven. They had stood on this rock expecting the Lord to take them from Ascension Rock. But the Lord did not return. He did not come. They thought they were right. They had established the parameters under which they understood that God would be redeeming them and taking them home on October 22, 1844. They had, in their mind, thought that the scriptures had taught that. And they had established their parameters. under. And when it didn't happen, they were disappointed. Of course, a great disappointment. But the Holy Spirit was actually leading to a better and different understanding. Not that the coming of Christ would not be welcomed, but the fullness of what the coming of Christ would come... They needed to learn. They needed to go back to their Bible, which many of them did. Many of them made that return. Well, as the church got going, as the church got going, as they got organized and they were beginning to do it, they began to think the gospel, and they looked at the gospel and the story here in Matthew, as we read in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Uh, for a witness to unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So I said, we need to take the gospel as a group. We need to take the great news that we have found as, as Adventists. We need to take it to the entire world. We need to make that happen. So where is the entire world? Well, of course, the entire world would mean the, the United States only. Because it's the melting pot. This is their thinking. The melting pot. All the nations of the world had come. So the gospel would be spread to those who had come to America... And we would take it because this was a very small group that said, we'll have, it's impossible. Do you really seriously think we can take it to the whole world? Give me a break. We're such a small group. It'll never happen. Adventism will never be able to be spread throughout the entire world. It's never going to happen because we're just way too small. <laughs> so in 1874... After much pleading and begging from a group in Europe, they were asking them, can't you please send somebody over to share with us the great truth of the sanctuary message and the Sabbath with us? Can't you send somebody? Please send somebody. And they kept sending messages from Europe as the Holy Spirit was working on them. Please send somebody. So eventually, eventually they said, oh, they recanted and said, we'll send out one one missionary. And so they sent J.N. Andrews, of which Andrews University is named after. In 1874, he and his two children set out for Europe, the first missionaries to go to happen. You see, what changed their minds? What changed their minds? What changed their minds was the Holy Spirit didn't need their approval of where he was going to work. The Holy Spirit wasn't bound that it's just the melting pot. He wasn't there just at the melting pot. What the Spirit of God says, I'm sharing my message, and so where is Adventism today? Why, today there are more Seventh-day Adventists outside of the melting pot than there are in, by far. 198, 199 countries is the last I remember. Around the world. Because the Holy Spirit did not need their, their permission. He did not need to operate in their parameters, you see. The Holy Spirit will go where do you wish us. During the 1940s, late 30s, early 40s, 
things were happening and political things were happening, were taking place, and there was a concern about Judaism and the Jews and what they were going to do, and they were looking for a homeland. And many of our evangelists got up and preached and shared that according to Scripture, Bible prophecy is clear that there will never be a state of Israel. God won't allow it. And they preached and preached and preached that, that there would never be a state of Israel as they held out their Bible and said it's been taught in Scripture to have happened. I don't know if you're aware, but in 1948, all that theology and all that preaching had to be trashed. All had to be trashed. You see, they thought they were right. Our pioneers about only going to the United States, they, they thought they were right. The revivalists in the 40s, they thought they were right. Now I'm going to introduce a subject to you that you might think I'm going to be making a statement about this subject. I only want to use it as a current illustration. I'm not making a public statement. So there will be not be a discussion about this afterwards. About this subject. One of my friends that I got acquainted with down in Southern California was Sandy Roberts. She's a wonderful woman. She is a pastor. I knew her when she was pastoring. She had many skills. She's a great, humble, wonderful young lady. Well, she's my age, I guess that's, well, still young, yes. So, young lady. Not too long ago, she was elected to be president of the Southeastern California Conference, of where she is serving now. She is the only woman president in North America. This has caused all kinds of consternation within the church, and some of this is going to be discussed this summer at our general conference session in Texas, in which the issue of women's ordination. She was ordained, but her ordination is not accepted by the general conference. And therefore, when the presidents get together, when general, she is not allowed to take part because she's a woman. Now, I use that only to not discuss women's ordination, but to use the point of uh, Acts 11, right? So as we look at Acts 11, Caution. I would ask us to say, where is Jesus leading us? Where is Jesus leading us? That would be the expression that we need to follow. You see, Peter, in his response to what had taken place when he saw the Holy Spirit, when he saw that movement, when he went, he had to change the parameters of his thinking because God was not operating in that way. And so he looked and followed where the Spirit of God drove him. From time to time in my ministry, we've had challenges like the one we just had at others that have come up. And it's like going to being involved in an auto accident. You know, you get into an auto accident, and sometimes I've had it. One time I was getting off the freeway, and there were a bunch of cars stopped in, the, in a running. Fortunately, it was in Portland, Oregon, and it was raining, which is not unusual. But it was raining, and, and we were all stopped, and some guy was getting off the freeway and didn't realize we were all stopped, and he bang, 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 bang. Pushed us all. I pushed, got pushed in the back, pushed into the car in front of me. He had hit the car behind me, and so the guy in the front got out, and he got out, and he was really angry. I could see as he got out, he was really angry at me. I had been sitting stopped. And he was ready to live it when he saw that it was a whole line of us that had gotten hit. Happened. So sometimes in our Christian life, we have experiences that happen that challenge us to find out where God is leading. Like the issue this summer, like other issues that the church has faced, I want to find out where God's spirit, where is Christ leading us? 
So I've learned over my few years in ministry is to please be patient and see where he's leading. See what doors God is opening or closing. Because God will eventually share with me and open to me and I can go, aha, that's where you're going. That's where it's happening. Where is he leading me? And I challenge you, where is he leading you? So when life's difficulties come and those challenges we face, and whatever they may be, whatever challenges they come, I want, as a follower of Christ, to say, where is the Spirit of God leading? And sometimes my preconceived parameters of what God is going to do get challenged because God goes in a different direction. And I want to be open to where God is leading me. That doesn't mean that I'm just foolish as following any whim. That means I want to show me from Scripture. You see, if the Millerites had really realized and accepted the truth about no man knows the day or the hour. No man knows the day or the hour. It would have saved them a lot of pain. They thought that they had figured out, cracked God's code. They thought they'd find, well, we understand, even though the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour, only the Father, well, we found it out. So I would challenge you today that as you make your journey, as you make your journey in Christ, that you follow where Jesus is leading and be patient for him to open the doors for you for understanding. I don't have an idea what's going to happen this summer. But I believe God leads his church. And I believe God leads me. I want to follow him. That's what I want to do. I'm praying that that's you too. God, where would you lead me? Dear Lord, I thank you for this great message out of Acts 11. For it brings us back to the concept. Brings us to the, of where are you leading us? We surrender this church, Father, to be able to follow you. We want to sense your spirit and what you're doing and where you're leading. But Father, sometimes it's hard to know from the experience. Sometimes things happen and throw up in our faces and, and a lot of dust goes in the air and concerns but Lord, we don't know where you may be leading us. But today, may we learn the patience of God. May we learn from you to be patient, to see the way open before us. And not rush to judgments, not rush. Let the scriptures unfold themselves. Be taught by your spirit to know where it is. To avoid sensationalism, but to follow the clear walking of your spirit. That way, we find security in you. We thank you for promising that you would do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing this prayer, I will follow thee, my Savior. Follow thee, I will.
should forsake thee. By thy grace I follow thee. And the Lord is calling thee, lost, cold and deep, thou leadest me. Thou hast crossed the ways before me, and I still. our prayer. The Lord, I will follow you. Wherever you would lead me, by your grace, I will follow. Please make your path clear to us. In his name, amen. May God give you grace and peace.